Nanette Roseanne Hamilton. Hello, greetings. My name is Roseanne Hamilton and I'm here to talk about Kawea basketry. I'm a Kawea basket weaver. I've been weaving over 25 years and um, I learned uh, to weave at Idlewild Arts uh, right when I was about in my 20s. And my teacher was Donna Largo. And at the time, there weren't very many teachers at that time. There was one elder that Donna Largo had known. Her name was Rosalie Valencia, and she was about in her 70s. And uh, Donna Largo didn't know how to weave a basket, so she went to her and asked her if she could still weave. So anyway, at that time, she was the only active weaver on our uh, reservation. So she went and talked to with her and they asked her if she could still weave a basket. And she said yes. So uh, they left and came back a few months later and she actually wove this basket. And I'll let me go through my photos here and I'll show you. Okay. She wove this basket here and it's called a whirlwind basket. It's a flat tray basket and it has um, the whirlwind in it with the sumac uh, design. It's a whirlwind out of the sumac fibers, and that's how we get the white in our designs. And uh, anyway, I wanna talk about the coiled basket, the Kawea coiled basket. It's a basket that is very um, time consuming, and you can't go out and make a basket like this in one day. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of um, skill to get to this point to actually sit down and start to weave a basket of this size. So this is a very old basket. It's probably about 80 years old, and it does have a juncus and a sumac and dyed juncus and deer grass in it. And uh, those are basically the fibers that we use to put together a basket like that. So what we do is we go out and we gather the materials. And after we're done gathering the materials, you can't just go out at a certain time or any old time you want to. You have to go out at a certain time at the, during this, the seasons that they're ready to be gathered. So I usually go out and we start with the yucca plant. This is a whippleye yucca, and this has already been dried. And anyway, it's a very fibrous plant, and this is actually the heart of the plant. So we'll go out and it has very, very sharp thorns. And probably when you're riding around with your parents in the local mountains, you'll, you probably have driven by it many times and seen the actual um, yucca plant growing. It has very sharp thorns on it. Like I say, we take the heart of the, bas the plant out and it kind of looks like this. And anyway, it's green and it has very, very sharp thorns on the end. Well, we remove those, and what I do is I'll go ahead and I'll take the plant and I cut it down the, the middle, and it's very, very sharp, very, very sharp fibers, and up and down it, it is very um, sharp also. It's almost like a scalpel or a serrated knife, so if you ran your fingers up and down it, it would cut your fingers. They're very, very hard grasses, the, these grasses that we use to make the basket, so it's like I say, getting back to it, this basket is about 100 or 80 years old. They've been known to last hundreds of years in museums. I think we're up to 1,200 years now that they've had and collected muse in the museums these types of baskets. So handed down in generation to generation, maybe the um, people of the weavers, the family of the weavers will have their baskets of their great-great-grandmothers and so on. So anyway, the grasses are very, very hard and they're very, very strong. So what I do is I'll go out uh, about July in the summer months and I gather this plant. And what I do is I'll take the plant and I cut it down the, the inside like this and I split them in half. And then I'll lay them out on a table and it takes me about a week till they turn this nice white color. And after that's done, I'll go ahead and put them in water and they kind of plump up and I'll take the inside of it with a knife and I'll scrape it out and I'll get, um, take the fibers out the inside. It's a pith that's in the in, 
in the inner side of the, the piece of uh, yucca. And then after that, what I do is I'll make little niches in, inside the, the tips like this, and I'll just peel it down, like kind of like a string cheese. And they make fibers, and I collect them, and uh, I make a little knot out of the fibers, and it kind of looks like that, but it's just a regular knot. And then I take a tool, and I'll put it down the center of the, the knot, kind of like that, and I'll set it aside. And then I move on to another plant. And the other plant that I'm talking about is the wrap. So that after we get through with the first um, start of the basket, it's the yucca start, then we move on to the juncus plant. And before we get to using and cleaning the juncus plant down and making it able to move around and weave into our basket, it looks like this. So the juncus plant grows on our reservation, kind of down below the casino on Highway uh, 371, and they actually put the highway right through the juncus stand. So if you drive through there, you'll pass right by the juncus. And uh, like I say, it has very sharp point tips at the end, and I'll usually take those off when I um, go out and gather. But um, basket weavers use their mouths as a third hand. So how we, after we're done gathering, uh, I'll go out and gather probably about that much of these plants. And it takes me about two days and I'm uh, splitting the material. So how I do it is I'll go ahead and uh, demonstrate now how the juncus plant is, is um, split. We put one in our mouth and the other two in our hands and we just pull evenly all the way down, like that. And then we collect them, and we'll put them in the sun, and about three to six months later of this being, it being out in the sun, kind of like I had demonstrated the yucca plant, it turns this nice tan. So it takes three to six months, maybe even a year, and it, it'll continue to lighten up. And so then we're ready to weave. So we'll take a piece of the, the juncus, the split juncus, and we get another tool. The tools are very important. So this is basically just a tin can with holes punched into it. And I'll, I'll wet the juncus. I give it a good soak, probably about a couple of hours. And um, I sit down and I, I'll clean the juncus, my m materials that I'm gonna use for my basket. And uh, anyway, um, I'll kind of do like I did the, the um, yucca fiber. I'll take it and I'll clean out all the inside and then I'm ready to size it down with the tin can. And that makes everything all nice and uh, you know even down the sides. And then I'm ready to weave. So I'll pick it up and then I take out that all, and take, go back to my knot and then I just take the piece of juncus and put it in the middle and start weaving in a circle, kind of like the, this is with um, black juncus, but I'll go into a circle. That's why it's called a coiled basket. So we start at the beginning and we'll just weave all the way around one stitch at a time. So that's why it's very time consuming and it, it takes a lot of patience to uh, make these baskets. And uh, the more even and the more um, uh, the more even your materials are, the more uh, even your stitches are. So anyway, that's how we um, make the start of the basket. After we're down to about here, it looks kind of like this. We have this little uh, start of the basket and we'll continue to weave, but it starts to, we run out of material here. So then we uh, move to another um, plant and it's called um, deer grass and it looks like this and it, it grows out all around the mountains and um, there's just a lot of it. A lot of people use it for their landscapes and it grows in meadows, but I got this up in the mountains. And what I'll do is I'll take a piece of leather and I'll pinch it here at the top, at the sun end and then I'll peel all those little uh, seeds off of there. 
These seeds are very, very sharp, and if you were to run your finger up and down that, it would get into your hands and it would cut you. So that's why I was saying the, the, plant, the grasses are very hard grasses and they um, you know, will last a very long time. So after we're done cleaning these little uh, seeds off, we collect them and then I cut them at an angle and I start adding them into the, the start. And then later it looks like this. So then I'll just continue to add and then I wet things down so nothing breaks because you always got to keep it nice and moist so it's pliable and it can bend and you can, um, you know, add your stitches. So that's how the beginning of the, the coiled basket is started. So anyway, I'd like to go back to the yucca plant. It is a very, very um, useful plant and we use it to make many, many things. Uh, there's even a little bit of soap in it. If I put these all in water and then swish the water around, it would bubble up a little bit. It's not our actual yucca plant, uh, our, our yucca soap plant, but it does have a little soap in it. Um, we use the fibers to make uh, yucca brushes and they kind of look like this. And you can make them at various sizes. Um, they're used to clean the baskets out or to clean the grinding mortars out of the, all the acorn and all that. Or I've even seen uh, young people that I've made these with will take it and um, one little girl from Sherman Indian High School, she actually brushed her hair with it. But they're very, it's very sturdy and um, we make also make paint brushes and um, Cordage, we can make cordage that's very, very strong. You can make them as thick or as thin or as long as you need to. And uh, it's, it's just a very, very useful plant. And we also make um, yucca sandals out of them. And um, not only do we use it to make our basket starts, but like I say, it's a very, very useful plant. And, um, you know, we make sure that we we use every bit of it. It was thought years ago, when I first started out, my teacher thought that the plant actually died when we went and pulled the heart out. But through the years, after going out and uh, seeing for myself that um, they don't die, they actually continue to grow and you can go out and re-gather uh, the materials. So that, that's the good part of it. But anyway, um, those are basically the um, materials that we use to start the basket. But when we want to add designs or color to the basket, kind of like these are, this is actually this old basket is, um, these little bands represent a rainbow. And if you look inside the basket there, there's a really pretty uh, flower there and it's lined with the sumac. So anyway, how we, actually get the colors for the designs are basically the only uh, color that we dye in the basket for the designs is the black. And this is black juncus. It's actually this plant, but I've used um, these plants here. I'll use cottonwood leaves and elderberry leaves, and I'll go ahead and put them in a huge cast iron pot. And uh, I've put water in it with the juncus and then I uh, fill the plants both in there and I'll put a lid on it and leave it outside and I leave it for about three weeks because I like the juncus to be really, really black. And so I'll push it all the way up as far as I can before it'll disintegrate because they're just plants and they will disintegrate if they're left in water too long. But anyhow, um, I um, pull it out and uh, use it for the the um, the dyed junkus for the designs in my baskets. And uh, anyway, different basket weavers have their own techniques and their own methods of how they um, make um, dyes, but that's, that's what I use. I just use the two different leaves and uh, do that during the summer warm months and take advantage of the sun. So um, anyway, uh, moving on. The uh, white, I had uh, mentioned that the white in the design there, you could see in the one in Rosalie's basket, are made with sumac. And it's kind of like a little tree, a little bush. 
And uh, these are actually sumac sticks. This is a chia seed beater. We make these to go out and harvest chia seeds. And uh, it's used with some of the junkus that I've wrapped it with to actually make this nice little tool here to go out and grab the seeds. But they're sumac, and if you notice on the inside, they're white. And we call this a sellet. And what sellet means is red. And the outside of this is the red skin. So when we leave it, I'll um, split it actually just kind of like I did the, the juncus plant. And uh, it's much more sturdier and a little more, you have to use a little more um, strength to you know, peel it and, and uh, split it. But anyway, um, the inside is really pretty after it is, uh, the design. It's very white, like the yucca plant, you can see. And then we use strips of that to uh, add into our designs. If you wanted to make a very sturdy basket that would hold um, very heavy objects, you would actually use um, the sumac plant to do that. And it's just very, very pretty material to work with. And uh, anyway, uh, it smells very good too. It has a nice smell to it. But um, anyway, getting on with the, the baskets, that's basically everything that we use to, um, to gather to um, dye and uh, basically put the, the coiled basket together. So something like this, they're very time consuming. I think my brother said it best that it uh, teaches patients humility and humility because um, it takes a lot of patience. You have to have a really good heart to um, work on your baskets. If you start getting frustrated and um, you know, fed up with a basket, it, it can get trying at times. But um, anyway, um, it, it won't work for you. So you have to have a really, really good heart and a nice area to work at and uh, you'll make something as pretty as this. But this here is very, very beautiful. Um, the basket weaver was very, very skilled. And um, it probably took her to make this basket here maybe a month of, you know, working on it eight hours a day. So um, we have the huge, huge, big baskets. I'll tell you about the uses now. Um, the baskets are used, uh, the basket hats, we'll talk about that. We actually have basket hats that we use, but they serve a great purpose. And they kind of look like this. And uh, the women wear them, also men have wore them too, but uh, women would wear them for uh, certain things. And you could use it as a, a drinky to drink water out of, or it was basically used to protect your head. Uh, this style of carrying method that we have, it's called an e-cut. And um, there's a knot up here that goes on the forehead. And then the back, on the back, it's kind of similar to a backpack. And uh, you would go out and gather and or carry things, large, heavy things inside this backpack. And the basket hat, wearing the basket hat there would protect your forehead when you carried very heavy things or put heavier things in your uh, carrying net. So that would protect you from the knot, the, your forehead from the knot. And this type of carrying method made it very, very easy to carry very heavy objects. I know um, a lot of the elders would um, carry their grinding stones or even wood on their backs so they could pack a lot of things into it. And here you can kind of see, make out, she has her, uh, she's gathering with her little, um, has her seed beater and she has another basket and then she has a basket it's set inside of it. It's a burden basket. Now, one of those burden baskets would probably take you up to two years to um, make because they get pretty big. And um, depending on the designs, uh, sometimes you have to start and stop and then add a design. And it's very mathematical. So you have to be, they say that this, a lot of the women were very, very good at math because they had to stop you're not just laying it down like a loom. You're actually uh, weaving inside, you know, a coil. So um, it's, uh, I kind of explain it, it's like um, beading without the beads. But anyway, you have to be really good at counting the stitches so they um, match up and can make these beautiful des designs on them. 
So anyway, um, the other uses that we have for um, weaving baskets are the um, water bottle. And it was similar to the uh, plastic bottles that we carry today, but you know we didn't have to throw away as much. And it would be wore with a long cord over the shoulder. And you could fill it with water and, and actually uh, carry it around with you. It would be more convenient than carrying a, a heavy, a huge um, piece of pottery with you. It was much lighter. But um, that's kind of how the elders, if you're weaving, They'll take your basket and they'll hold it up to the sun and that's how they grade you on how good and tight your weaves are. But um, anyway, they look and hold it to the sun and see if there's, they can see the sun through it. And if they do, then you have to do a little more work and go back and do a little more practice. But uh, the Kawea people were able to weave a watertight basket without having to add any pine pitch or saps to the outside to waterproof it. So there was another tribe up north, but I don't know the name of the tribe, but there was only two tribes in California who could weave a watertight basket. And that's kind of what the, the weavers want to um, get their weaving, you know, stitches to that, that point. But anyway, uh, another thing that we use um, the baskets for are basically like our dishes. And uh, anyway, here's a nice pretty cup that was in the LA, one of the LA museums. Uh, I think it's long closed, but you know, these were the, some of the cups that were used, the drinking cups. Also, um, we have food platters that, um, here's a rattlesnake basket with a condor on the top. And uh, it's a pretty famous um, basket design for Kauia, and um, these were used for um, food platters, and they would be used to put certain foods in during that time. So um, that's what uh, we used our, the baskets for, was basically our dishes. Also, um, they could be used to cook in, and we have the big, huge coiled basket, and I've seen the women still do it today, They'll take their acorn and they'll put the flour in there and then they get hot rocks and heat them up in the fire, get them really hot and then put the water in and drop it in and then swish them around with these huge cooking sticks so they don't burn through the basket and they cook up the, the acorn right inside the basket, kind of like your mother would make her, um, her oatmeal or her cream of wheat on the stove, it's kind of the same thing same consistency, but anyway, that's how, you know, they make and serve right out of the basket. And it's pretty amazing to watch them do that. But anyway, um, that's what the, the main purposes of our coiled basket would be used to store and collect and, you know, all these different things that we, we use these baskets for and certain ceremonies and things like that that we have. And uh, anyway, um, they're very, very important. And not everybody could weave and make, um, uh, you know, the Kauia basket. So we had the basket weavers that were among the, the people, they would be held in high regard because they could do something that um, not everyone else could do. So they would be able to go out and trade their baskets or um, make them for others. And, you know, they could make a real good living doing that, just trading their baskets. And um, anyway, uh, so that's basically the, the uses and the materials that we use for the coiled baskets. Now, um, I was talking about we have uh, other uh, baskets too that we use the juncus plant out of. And um, I'm going to talk about that is the leaching basket or sifter basket. And it's basically a uh, whole juncus, meaning that the juncus rod is just, it's a twine basket, and we don't split it, we just uh, use them in a twine technique. And what we would use these baskets for is they're much, they're very light, and uh, we would use it for um, sifting or leaching our acorn. So we would put a piece of cloth on top or leaves and then put the acorn flour 
and pour the water over and the water comes out the bottom, kind of like your mom would use a colander rinsing her spaghetti in the kitchen. So it's kind of the same you know, purpose that we use the leaching baskets for. And they're pretty quick to make. You could make something like this in a couple of hours and um, they last and they're pretty sturdy. So um, you can make them into various shapes and uh, gather with, so you could carry those, they're very light. So, um, you know, they're, they're not heavy to cart around plus whatever you're gathering. So it, it's very convenient to make those types of baskets. I had a picture too that here's one of the older baskets. I think it was like 100 years old that was at the San Bernardino Museum, which was, um, I believe it was a San Manuel basket or Cahuilla, but it's kind of similar, you know, to the, this basket here, but it's very old. So um, anyway, uh, that's what we use the sifter baskets for. The, um, the granary baskets were used to store large amounts of food in and we would use them and make them out of willow or uh, sumac sometimes and then down in the desert they would make theirs out of arrowweed or um, I think it's arrowweed and maybe the uh, mesquite branches. So those basically were made by men because the size of them were meant to use and we were, they're used to uh, uh, dry like a year's worth of acorn. So if you went out and you were gonna feed your family acorn all year, you'd gather them in the fall and then you'd gather enough to last you and your family through the whole year. So you'd need something to dry them in and keep them in so you know they wouldn't be all over and the animals will beat you to them. But anyway, the, the, the baskets look like this, the granary baskets. And like I said, they were usually made by the men. And they were kept up on wooden stilts or up on a rock or on a building or just flat on the ground. But this man, he made his basket out of the, um, I think it's the willow down in the desert. So um, anyway, Here's another one of the Kuiya baskets, and we use our willow there. Sometimes we'll leave the leaves on, or we um, will take the strip them down. Uh, I like to strip mine down, but I, I kind of make them uh, with the leaves on too. So here's kind of a this is a a little tray basket. When I I first learned how to weave this type of granary basket but I've made uh, uh, huge baskets about this size that I can't put my arms around. But anyway, um, the willow, it has a very nice smell to it. If you, you can smell the willow and it's sandbar willow, so it grows out in the washes. And I have a, a little stand in the back of my house where I uh, have my, gather my willow at. And anyway, I like it for the color because it has this nice, these nice green leaves, but it's nice and red. And when I work on them, they smell the house, you know, really nice. And the, the uh, insects and different things like that don't like the smell of that. So it has a natural pesticide that would keep, you know, all the bugs or insects out of the food so they wouldn't get into your um, acorn or your uh, pinion nuts or corn or, you know, you could, you could store a lot of food in there. And that was, um, you know, it's naturally uh, on the plant. So it was really uh, smart that, you know, they would come up with making something like that. But like I said, they were very, very uh, huge baskets. And you see the lady here with her mound of um, acorn inside the basket. and it's drying and it's perfect, you know, for the, the acorn. But anyway, that's what they were used out of. And the coiled basket and the leaching baskets were usually, usually made by women. But nowadays um, we have men weavers that uh, weave and they do just as good of a job as women do. So, um, you know, we not only have just one weaver, but we have many weavers now and we have many teachers and um, we just still keep teaching it to our, our children and our grandchildren and 
you know, whoever wants to learn and, and make a commitment to do this, you know, and, and carry on. So um, anyway, um, we'll talk a little bit about the tools now. It's very important to a basket weaver to come across, you know, a good set of tools. And um, I have been lucky to have a lot of nice uh, friends that have come and gifted me with a lot of different awls and, and things like that. And anyway, um, I've had this uh, awl right here. It's a, a little nail with um, sharpened up with a little wood handle on it. And I've had it probably about 20 years now. And I just use that and it's made many baskets. But I was given this by one of my friends who is a beater and she actually uh, made this little um, basket here. But she makes these beautiful um, bead necklaces with these um, pottery beads on them. And uh, she gave me that, it was her first basket. Because when you make a basket, the first one you make, you have to give it away. But you get a person that, you know, um, who will appreciate it really a lot. And the more they appreciate it, the more luck you get. So um, sometimes people get a little heartbroken to give away all that hard work on their first basket. But, you know, it, it, they have to pick someone that they, you know, they can, go and visit it a lot too. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> here is a Papago um, style basket all. And it's basically a bed spring with a nice handle. I don't know what type of wooden handle, but that's the type that they use down that way. And um, one of the, the students that I had, him and his family, and he's from our tribe, his name is Adrian. He made me this uh, deer antler all. And I, he put this nice little handle on it so I can just put it down. I don't, and then I can get it again, you know? <laughs> so that, that's really nice. And then um, Willie Pink had given me this because um, I was showing him that I was making the granary baskets. And so anyway, he gave me this all and it's a coyote bone all. So anyway, we'd use this and I'll kind of de demonstrate. We kind of push that through and make the hole and then just pull the, the um, branch through there. And uh, uh, kind of is the same way we start the coiled baskets that, that I stitch the, the granary baskets, but that's kind of neat, you know. And then of course, like I said, the um, tin can. And um, before the tin can, some of the students ask and say, well, what did you use before you had a tin can? Well, we would use a shell. You can use, um, you know, a seashell and uh, kind of get the same effect because we're kind of just trying to use the blade there to um, size down our materials. So anyway, this one here is a um, mesquite um, chimawebe uh, basket all, and it was given to me by one of the uh, linguists here. His name is Raymond, and he gifted me that. And uh, anyway, that's kind of neat too, you know, how they make theirs. And then I have another granary all basket all. It's a larger nail and it's kind of blunt on the end because I don't really want it sharp. And this here is the manzanita all. But um, those are all my tools. And, um, you know, I, I keep them with me all the time and, and uh, use them all the time. But um, when you go out into the forest, when you go out with your parents out into the wilderness, you know, just make sure that, you know, when you go out that, you know, you keep the environment clean and, you know, uh, fires are a big issue that we have now. Just be careful when you're out there and keep everything clean because the, this is a, a gift for you and, and your future generations that are coming. So, you know, I always, end with uh, saying that, that, you know, we still use these materials. We eat the food that's out there and there's so much to eat and gather. And we um, store and cook and use these baskets and the plants that are out. So, you know, there's an abundance of um, food sources out there that, you know, our people use and we continue today. But, you know, you can help by, um, you know, keeping them clean for the generations to come. So anyway, I hope you learned a little bit about baskets. And I usually ask, can you make a basket like this in one day? No, you can't. It takes like a lot of hard work to gather and 
uh, prep the materials and then a lot of patience and time to make something like this. So thank you again and I hope you enjoyed and learned something about Kauia baskets.